Carla Nixon, welcome to the show. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah, thank you so much for being on today. I really do appreciate your time. And so, you know, I followed you for a while and I've wanted to have you on the show. I know many of my viewers have been vocal about having you on the show for a while. Um, so it's great to finally speak. And one of the things that I like to uh, first ask people about other uh, you know, anti-imperialist left-wing content creators is uh, any kind of censorship that you may have faced. Because I don't know if you're familiar with my show, but over the last uh, five uh, five months or so, I've uh, had a lot of censorship. I had uh, an episode with Cynthia McKinney deleted because of a patron question to her. I had uh, another video with Jimmy Dore deleted because of a question to him saying it was medical misinformation. Um, I had I had my uh, 2018 State of the Union review from four years ago, recently deleted for being cyberbullying. So uh, censorship is obviously just going off the rails. And we've seen that with many folks from RT, um, just seeing their entire content libraries deleted, seeing their podcast deleted, like was the case with Lee Camp, his podcast that was unrelated to his RT show. So obviously things are going off the rails. I'm just wondering from a personal level, level what kind of censorship have you experienced? Well, and in fact, it's funny you ask that because right now I'm on another 29 day or 30 day suspension from Facebook. This is the second time and both of it, both of the, of the times were related to comments or uh, articles that I posted about Nazis in Ukraine. The most recent one, I posted an article, an NBC News article and pictures from the NBC News article that basically showed um, Nazis in Ukraine on the, this was a 2014 article if, and it was referring to a, a, um, a German news story in a German media outlet that showed these people on Ukraine in Ukraine on the border, Ukrainian soldiers, and they had like swastikas and SS things on their helmets. I mean, you know, if you're an Ukrainian soldier, that's not all that strange, right? <laughs> Apparently, and um, and. Facebook, the last time they, it was the first time that I was got a 30 day suspension, it was because I um, posted a picture of some Ukrainian soldiers in front of a Nazi flag. This Is that time, the one with them with the, the NATO flag also? No, they're not that one. It was a different one with the, with the Ukrainian flag. It had a Nazi symbol in the middle and it was kind of had the Ukrainian colors. You know, I mean, again, the Ukrainian soldiers, I mean, there's Nazi flags and insignia. That's kind of their thing. And at any rate, I mean, I mean uh, you know, they post that stuff. But at any rate, um, so I got 30 days for that. So this time it was an NBC News article. Now, NBC News isn't um, suspended from Facebook. And they're the ones that wrote the article. And you can still find it on the NBC News' website. But I guess um, what they said was, I believe it may be, no, no, Twitter got me for bullying when I referred to Nazis as a bunch of idiots and freaks. And they wow. said, you know, you, you can't gotta refer to Nazis bullying. as idiots. I mean, you really, you, you got to really look out for these Nazis. I mean, who stands for them? That's the question. Who stands for the Nazis? <laughs> Apparently Twitter and Facebook, that's the answer. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just uh, an insane level of uh, censorship, A, but just uh, the cognitive dissonance coming from these folks. The scary part, too, is with this new uh, government disinformation board um, that they announced a couple weeks ago. And also the fact that they have Nina Jankowicz, who is obviously this uh, mentally ill person who is going to be running this and somebody who has spread disinformation, not just about one thing, but about a wide variety of things from Russiagate itself uh, to the Hunter Biden laptop pushing back on that, saying that that was Russian disinformation when it wasn't. Um, I mean, she's she's called WikiLeaks scum. She's blocked uh, different folks from the gray zone and, and uh, attacked them. She said that effectively called Jill Stein a, a Russian stooge. So, um, you know, it's it's crazy that this person is going to be in charge of this agency. But it's also crazy that this agency is even existing, how it's not a direct violation of the First Amendment. And, you know, that's that's really what I struggle with from a legal perspective is when they create something like the, the um, Disinformation Governance Board which is a clear violation of the First Amendment. And also with these deplatforming and everything that we're seeing, like that's obviously government directed. And even Jen Psaki pretty much admitted that in a press conference last year saying that the, that the White House is flagging posts for Facebook. So from a legal perspective, how are they able to get away with this? How is it not just um, you know, shot down by the Supreme Court or by Congress as a clear violation of the First Amendment? Well, it's an end around the First Amendment, you know, really, because rather than the government doing it themselves, they basically, you know, it's it's a, an, another uh, another um, 
uh, example of the use of government contractors to do government work in the same way that the CIA, you know, they contract Booz Allen, et cetera, et cetera. So now you have government contractors to get around the, the, um, the First Amendment. There's an argument to be made, a very powerful argument to be made. And there, people can look up a case called Pruneyard versus California, where there was an argument that um, there was a shopping center that was private property. However, the argument was made that though it's private property, it's still um, like the town square uh, kind of thing where people meet to exchange ideas. Therefore, uh, the speech is protected on there. There were people like handing out leaflets. Well, I think that argument also applies to Zoom, to the, uh, excuse me, to Twitter, et cetera, to the social media in that they are, this. these are now, um, online areas where people meet to exchange ideas and they should be considered like the town square. Um, a couple of things on old uh, Scary Poppins as, as, uh, as, uh, as a number of my friends call her. She is in fact the perfect person in a kind of weird way to head this, um, to head this disinformation government board because she knows the rules. Right. And one of the things I, that I was looking over some of her tweets and some of the things that she did in some of the articles. And the most telling was when the um, Clinton people put out this. Um, the Clinton people put out this these tweets when they did the the uh, the the Trump's. What was the argument? It, it, it's what the uh, Seussman charges are over. They, they, you know, came up with this fraudulent claim that Donald Trump was using his servers to clandestinely communicate with some Russian bank servers. And therefore, we got him Trumpity Trump, 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 Russia. And as the day that the Clinton team released their PR move by basically Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, tweeting, there we go, we got him this time, there's Trump and Russia's stuff. The next day, she tweeted, this confirms our worst fears about Trump, confirms. So what she did was made the argument that an assertion or an allegation is in fact a confirmation. Right. So they picked her because she knows the game. The game is if there's a mainstream narrative, assertions should be should be treated as confirmation of something. So in reality, I'll end by saying this, the game is this. Disinformation only comes from people who oppose the mainstream and or government narrative. Disinformation never comes from the government. It only comes, disinformation is in fact defined now by these ghouls as people who cha challenge the mainstream narrative, regardless of whether it's true or false, if it challenges the mainstream narrative, it's, it's disinformation, regardless of whether it's true or false, it's true or false. If it comes from a mainstream in stream entity supporting the narrative, it's not disinformation. And that's the rules. She knows that she plays it well. She's the perfect person for that, for that um, board. Yeah, and you know she is uh, effectively a partisan hack as well. I mean, she defended Joe Biden uh, firing uh, the prosecutor in Ukraine, and she's just been a, a loyal uh, Democratic apologist. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of misinformation, it's kind of what we also have seen with the term conspiracy theorist, right? Because uh, anything that is alleging that the government is doing any kind of wrongdoing, that's a conspiracy theory. But um, when the corporate media and politicians come up with a conspiracy theory like like Russia Gate. That is not a conspiracy theory. That's effectively fact because they are the ones alleging it. Yeah, and and the bottom line is this is a war on critical thinking because first of all, just the term you know, do you use the term conspiracy theory in its literal meaning? Well, there are conspiracies, and it's nothing. There's nothing wrong with having theories about them, but they of course imply to absurd theories, and they um, put it all together. So any conspiracy theory, whether valid or or, or whether or not it has a, a, a you know a substantial foundation, is negative, um, and so ultimately they just say anything again it's anything that opposes the mainstream narrative must be attacked it can be attacked as russian misinformation as a conspiracy theory as whatever terms they want but it all amounts to the same thing it's a war on critical theory theory excuse me critical thinking when they put forth their superficial assertions you can only accept them in the most superficial way. Okay, they made this claim, therefore we must accept it as the gospel. And if someone starts asking questions, well, wait a minute, let's dig into this a little deeper. How do you, no, 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 no. Now you're getting into conspiracy theories and things of that nature because you're asking questions that need not be asked. Mm -hmm.
And what I find most sad about it is, you know, if you look at all these different policies and how Democrats are embracing them, um, from embracing you know, U.S. hegemony and uh, you know, NATO expansionism to uh, silencing dissent in the U.S. and uh, just you know, a whole list of other things, they, they really, to a large degree, have embraced neoconservatism. And it almost seems to me as though neoconservatism was uh, rebranded and repackaged and you know, effectively marketed to the, the Democratic Party. And it's, uh, it's sad because you know, I remember 15, 17 years ago, uh, marching against the, the Iraq war. I remember September 2005, half a million people were in the streets of, of Washington, D.C., protesting, you know, not just against the Iraq war specifically, but everything that the Bush administration stood for, from their corruption to torture to spying to, to just uh, everything. Uh, you know, neoconservatism, really. And you know, I, I kind of wonder what happened to those half a million people. I know that some of them you know, are still activists, people like Cindy Sheehan and folks at Code Pink, for example. But what happened to all those normal people who were out in the streets protesting against the Bush regime? regime? You know, it, how did they effectively go from, uh, again, being opposed to neoconservatism to now embracing neoconservatism because it's wearing a blue tie? Well, you, you, I think you answered the question at the end. They, 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 they've, um, they, what they were taught is you're part of a team you're, and you support your team, you know, regardless of what's said and anything that your team asserts is right. So we, as you, when, even when your team turns into the other team, you still have to, you have to, have to support them because they're your team. You know, if you think back why I was one of the people, we were in the street and we were um, fighting against the Iraq war. I was at gigantic um, rallies and protests, all that kind of stuff. But at the same time, Joe Biden was in the Senate intelligence, excuse me, Senate foreign relations committee, making sure it happened. We found out later that Nancy Pelosi blocked any investigations into torture with the CIA because she had been advised of it at the time that it was going on. So what we find out is that at, at, when the rank and file Democrats were opposing neoconservative policies, the leadership of the Democratic Party was in fact involved in executing those same policies. So what has happened is they have dragged their, um, they have basically, they turned the Democratic Party, as both parties are in my opinion, here's what I say, they're not not parties anymore, they, they're brainwashed cults. So they've turned people into a cultish group of um, followers simply waiting for their next order. Who do we hate next? What are we opposed next? Who are we? Who's our next adversary or enemy? Who's on the out? And so it's a, just a cult saying, who do we hate? Well, this week it's uh, your biggest danger is anti-vaxxers. You got to hate them. Okay, well, nah, that was so last week. How about this? The Russians. Great. Oh, we hate the Russians. Oh, the Chinese. Can we throw them in there? Yeah. So they're just waiting rather than having a um, an intellectual conversation about what are the dangers and what assertive things can a party do to make your life better. They're waiting, they, they've taught their followers to wait with bated breath for the next scapegoat, the next group or, or the next um, you know, group of individuals or external threat that they're to hate and be frightened of. So you keep them in a perpetual state of fear and anger and they are not... Um, you know, the, the people of the party are not, don't have time to have concerns about their own um, well-being and vote for their own pocketbooks. And I agree. I mean, it is bipartisan. I think that we saw that uh, yesterday or the day before with uh, the $40 billion aid package that was passed. That was uh, nearly unanimous. The, the only people who objected, there are uh, 57 dissenting votes in the House. That was all from Republicans. So not, not a single Democrat dissented. And, uh, you know, in statements from uh, from Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, it seems as though they would support it in the Senate. So, I mean, that that's really what I find most frustrating is that it seems as though they're like any remnants of uh, the anti-war, anti-imperialist left that may have been in the Democratic Party or any rhetoric that they may have been embracing, at least for purely for political reasons. That's completely gone now. And uh, they are just so remarkably loyal to Joe Biden, which is confusing to me, right, because his. His uh, poll numbers are at uh, historic lows. Um, you know, I think he kind of discredits himself every time he, op he opens his mouth. But um, you know, even his approval ratings with key demographics that he relies upon and will rely upon in 2024, they're, again, at historic lows. So I don't really know why they're going along with this so loyally. I don't know if it's because you know, they, uh, they just don't want to put themselves outside of the box and risk it. I don't know if it's because they're tied in with like uh, middle seat consulting and groups like that. I don't know if it's because they own stock in, in Raytheon and Boeing. I'm not quite sure, but um, it's just remarkable to me that there's not a single Democrat in Congress who would stand up against this. Like there's no more Dennis Kucinich's, there's no more Tulsi Gabbard's, 
again, if you want to reverse this to the to the Bush years, like at least there was Ron Paul in the Republican Party. There's there's just nobody like that in Congress right now. And I, I think that's what's most sad of all. Well, I think I, I will put it differently. I don't think it's Joe Biden that they are wedded to. I think, and, and now this may seem controversial, but I truly believe these things, <clears throat> that the United States has really um, uh, turned into somewhat of a totalitarian state. And to me, totalitarian states have, you know, they're one of two main characteristics. One of them is that they unify around a central figure of power, some kind of a dictator. I think the Republican Party tends to be more, they have that inclination, you know, Donald Trump or whoever the hell, you give them some strong man and they're going to be like, hooray, this guy's going to take us to glory. Whereas the Democratic Party now has devolved, I was going to say evolved, but devolved into something, into a different kind of totalitarianism, wherein the party and its followers are um, uh, all wedded to an ideology. And so with them, it's Joe Biden, uh, um, he represents that ideology. And it's an ideology with, that has a number of factors, not the least of which being imperialism, but the imperialism is cloaked in goodness and kindness. So where Donald Trump just says, look, we're taking the oil because we want the oil, the Democratic Party now says, well, we have to go bring these people, whatever we're going to bring, democracy, we're looking out for their people, blah, blah, blah. It's exactly the same outcomes, but they use something different to convince the schmucks, the cult members, the brainwashed cult members in their party that even though we're doing the same thing and we have the exact same policies as the Republicans, we're doing it for good reasons, so you should support us. And the way I look at it is, and again, people may consider this um, controversial, but these are truly my feelings, that they are various strains of fascism to some extent. I consider an ultra-liberalism, because if ultra-nationalism is fascism, which Clearly, that's what people refer to as fascism. What we're seeing now is an ultra liberalism. The ultra, and, 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 and I think they're similar in this in, the, in this this way. One of the things about fascism is it borrows from anything. Fascist, a fascist leader or a fascist ideology borrows from the right. We are a great country. We're the greatest country. We are nationalists, right? It borrows from the left. We're here to do good things and to bring us all together and blah, blah, blah. Fascism borrows from all ideologies and puts it all together, mainly because it doesn't matter what they say. It's all a fraud. <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter what they say, watch what they do. So if you're a fascist, you can tell the people anything because it's all lies. That's what this ultra liberalism, which is an ultra wokeism, we're doing, we're going to this country, Afghanistan, why? To help the women, right? We got to help the women. How are you going to help them? Well, right now we're starving them all to death, but we want to get back to bombing them too because we got to help the women of Afghanistan. And that's what it boils down to, justifications. And that is a form of totalitarianism in that those same types of things are used to um, suppress dissent and suppress the inevitable uprisings that are coming in a, in, a, in, a, in a falling empire. Hey, Garland, why are you saying that you don't want us to go to country X and invade? You're bullying, literally, you're bullying the Nazis. when They don't say that, but when I say on Twitter, these idiots and freaks, ah! You can't say that because it's bullying. Same type of thing. I'm protecting the Nazis. Why? It's not the Nazis, but I don't want to see anybody bullied, even the guys that are goose stepping and screaming, see Guile. You know, we got to think of them too. And that's that. Those are my thoughts. So, how long do you think that this cognitive dissonance can really hold for? Because, again, um, not only are they completely in contrast to the values that they previously espoused, and you can see that in examples with Julian Assange, who used to be a liberal hero. And now they're cheering the uh, slow torture and uh, murder of. Um, but, you know, not just the values aspect, but also the realities of our day-to-day -day lives where gas prices are skyrocketing, uh, food prices are going up, the, the stock market is effectively crashing. It has gone down about 4,000 points over the last three weeks. So a lot of people's 401ks are just getting wiped out. Um, and at the same time, the ruble is actually trading higher now than it was uh, prior to the operation in Ukraine. So the sanctions seem to have had zero effect, if not actually bolstering the Russian economy by uh, forcing them to trade with other countries. So um, again, like how long can that cognitive dissonance hold out where people um, are, are believing in this, uh, this ideology that they have at the expense of their day-to-day their -day reality? I'll go back to, you know, the, an old saying they have in Europe. 
When the people don't have bread, it's off with the leader's head. <laughs> so in reality, this works um, as long as people are fairly comfortable, as long as people can survive. You know, you can tell them anything because, you know, they're going about their daily lives online, watching their propaganda and things of that nature. However, I believe that they are creating a disastrous, an economic disaster. And that's when people will get very, very selfish and say, okay, great, we're all for going over here, bringing democracy to whoever the hell and going to this country, looking out for the women's and the women and the gay people and all the things that you tell us you're doing. Wonderful, fine. We are hungry and our lives are turning into a living hell. Do something about it. And um, we now have a government that is, completely decoupled from its constituents. So not only do they not have the capability to do it, they don't have the inclination to do it. And so that's, I think, the um, in creating this economic disaster, this is they're creating fertile environments for some level of uprisings. Now, I'm not using the term uprisings. I don't want to use that as saying people are going to go burn the place down. I ain't saying that they're not either. I have no way of knowing, but I do say that the more difficult the economic uh, period gets, the more likely it is that there will be um, changes in the people in government. Uh, watch, I'm gonna keep an eye on the, uh, everybody's talking about 2024, I mean, the midterms. I'm gonna keep my eyes on the primaries because in reality, the primaries are important. That's where the, people in power control the choices. So in the end, for president, you got two options, either John McCain or John McCain. Some version, some iteration of John McCain is available. Which one do you want? John McCain or John, what will it be the female John McCain or the African-American John McCain? You know, that's what they want, but you're getting John McCain. But the primaries is where that all can be um, changed. And I suspect that the primaries in the summer and the primaries going into 2024 are going to be very interesting in Congress and in, 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 in uh, the White, is White House. And I, 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 here's my prediction for 2024. Some independent or independents will make significant inroads in the general election and you'll end up not having 270 votes or 271, whatever it takes, and the it'll go back to the House. But that will be extremely disruptive to the machine. And remember, in the Senate, if you're independents, we have so-called independents, but they're not now, you don't have to have 100 or 50 or 20 of them. All you need is three or four. Because generally, the Senate is close enough to 50 that if you got three or four true independents, they can look at both parties and say, which ones do you want? Do you want me to caucus with you or you, you know, kind of like parliamentary systems. And if you want me to caucus with you guys, you're going to have to give me X, 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 or I'm not going to do it. And then they can say, well, I'm not caucus with anybody, or they can say, I'm caucusing with you guys, but you know what? I'm not anymore. If you do this, I'm not caucusing with you. I'm going to caucus with the other people. And now they're going to have the power and they're going to be people offering. So three or four senators that are truly independent completely disrupts the system. And I think that's where I see an opportunity for change. But I think those kind of things are going to happen simply because um, the economic crash that's coming is, you know, going to be something that we haven't seen, if ever, but if not, at least since the 20s. Yeah, I mean, uh, I also, you know, just looking at the stock market day to day and also with cryptocurrency, I don't know if you've been following that too, but, but Bitcoin has, uh, has just completely plummeted as well. So, I mean, the, the economy, and, and obviously we're talking about the, the gas prices are at all time highs, and they're talking about food shortages, and there's a baby uh, formula so shortage now. So, I think the economy is really going to be uh, heading to a dark place this summer, unfortunately. Um, but as far, like, as far as electoral politics, I wonder how um, possible it is for, for any kind of independent to get elected, just given, uh, just given the way that, that the electoral system is set up. And also, you know, the, the way that I think kind of operatives infiltrate these parties and, and kind of determine what, what happens within them. Um, I would argue even within third parties, we've seen elements of that with, uh, you know, funding and uh, primaries being rigged and whatnot. So, um, and the rhetoric that's been embraced there. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I kind of wonder how it's even possible for any kind of independent minded person to get elected. I mean, I've even seen where uh, a, a independent uh, candidates, um, staff and his, his, his campaign staff were effectively um, misrepresenting him publicly and hiding his actual opinions. Um, so, you know, I, is it really possible for a, a true free thinker to get elected even with the backdrop of a financial collapse? 
I think so. I think the um, the fertile ground for true independence to get elected, for even anti-imperialists to get elected, for people who would push back against this machine is the level of um, uh, the level of economic um, you know disaster. If it gets as bad as it gets, you know, it's got to get really, really bad. And once people get really get hurt, start hurting, they're going to be angry. They're going to be asking some questions, and they're going to do some drastic things. So I do think that um, yes, the level of because initially, like the midterms, I think coming in the midterms, the we're looking, you know, look at the. Um, primaries that are going on now going into the midterms and there's going to be some you know some changes there there's going to be probably some surprising things that happen but the midterms initially what people are going to do is what they do every four to eight years the ping pong thing the republicans are in and they have both houses and all of that and they botch everything up and they screw everything up and people are like i've had enough of this blue wave 2006 2008 comes there's all the democrats oh wait a minute this ain't working red wave blue wave red wave and i think we're going to get to the point where people are like Okay, we just put the Republicans back in and uh, the only thing that Republicans have, you know, the Democrats come in and they promise to do something and they do nothing. Well, excuse me, the Republicans come in and they do these giant tax cuts for corporations and rich and austerity for the rich and then more austerity and things of that nature. And the Democrats say, if you just put us in office, we'll fix all the things that the Repub Republicans did. The Democrats get in office and they say we can't because of uh, Joe Manchin. And uh, the Senate parliamentarian and uh, the sun's in our eyes. And, you know, they come up and I've got a burr under my saddle. But, you know, they come up with excuses. So the Republicans do the dirty work. And then the, the Democrats come in and they make excuses why they can't fix it. I think that coming in to uh, November, the, the Republicans are going to come in and they say, we're here to fix it. And they'll do some investigations on Hunter Biden or some crap like that. Right. But they're just going to say, here, the way we're going to fix it is. We're going to cut any social safety nets that you have, take all your money. Oh, by the way, there's more for the military industrial complex and things like that. And we're going to help the rich, help the corporations and take every dime you have and say, you just have to work harder. Um, so they're just going to rig the system even more and screw things up even worse. And uh, I think that's when you'll see people start to wake up and recognize, man, the Democrats were a disaster. And my God, you people are disastrous only in a little bit of a different way. And that's why when I start to sit, think going into 2024, hopefully that we make it that long, <laughs> that, um, we, you know, you'll start to see some people looking in other directions. Yeah, it is remarkable because they seem to almost compete to be worse, right? Like from a Democratic Party perspective, they're doing so many things that are just destroying the economy right now, um, primarily the sanctions. Um, but, you know, also, uh, Joe Biden seems to, he, he's supposed to be making an announcement at some point this summer. He said a couple of weeks, but it, it may be later because it, it's, he has until August 31st. But he's supposed to make some statement about student loan forgiveness. He seems to have suggested that he will not go up to $50,000. Um, and it, it seems, uh, it's, it would be odd to me that they would have student loan payments resume, uh, you know, in the midst of a financial crash, which I think would, would just be insane. Um, but then also, you know, uh, just from the, the $40 billion to Ukraine, like they're sending, like while we're having a baby formula shortage and food shortage and gas prices going up, they're sending tens of billion dollars to Ukraine. But at the same time, Republicans are just competing to be worse, right? Like you have them uh, moving to ban abortion, which is just going to help Democrats. Like the timing of it just seems absurd that they would do it right before the election. And then also too, like they're running against student loan forgiveness. So they're effectively running on keeping 45 million people uh, with unpayable debts. So it's it's just remarkable to me how they're competing to be worse and worse. So just curious what your thoughts are on that. And then also specifically student loan forgiveness, if you have any thoughts on what's going to happen with that. A couple of things. I think it's just that both parties, it's what I said, both parties really are that bad. There's just two different strains of horrible. And so they run on the things that they believe in and the things that they believe in are horrible, just a little different, a different flavor of horribleness. Um, on student loans, I don't, you got to keep in mind something. I don't think that Biden really can um, uh, uh, forgive student loans. Here's why. Slabs, student loan asset backed securities. As you probably know, the way Wall Street makes money now, the way the financialized economy makes money is through magic. So there's all these student loans. So they take these student loans and they slice them into little bits. Theoretically, they're not really 
even there, but they slice them into little bits and they call it asset backed securities. And they sell the little bits saying, as these student loans get paid off some magical way, you'll get X amount of percentage. In reality, all they're doing is they're selling these asset backed securities and you buy them hoping that you can sell them to somebody else for more than you got them. It's all a fraud, right? So how can he forgive all these student loans and get rid of them if these other Wall Street people have already sold chunks of these <laughs> student loans as asset backed securities? Now, in reality, he could because the asset backed securities doesn't really exist. They're magic. So what difference would it make if you sold what they're based on? Because they're not really based on anything but a fraudulent idea that somehow you'll make the money from the student loans and you'll make money for the asset backed securities. It just exposes the absurdity of this financialization of our economy. But I don't really think he'll do it because it, they may get afraid that, that if he does that, that the people who bought the asset backed securities will start asking them questions they can't answer like, well, how are you going to pay us off if those student loans don't exist anymore? And how's that going to affect our asset-backed securities? They don't have answers to any of that stuff because it's all a fraud. So if somebody starts asking them questions, now they have to make up an answer to something that doesn't really exist. The other thing is this, I think. I think we're missing the boat on really the whole student loan. Not that, okay, great. Yeah, it's a good idea to, 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 um, to, um, uh, 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 get rid of the student loans to forgive all certain of them, whatever. But here's the thing. A guy's an alcoholic and he takes his bottle of whiskey up and he goes to drink and you slap it out of his hand. Well, he doesn't have that bottle of whiskey anymore, does he? What's he going to do? He's heading back to the liquor store because he's an alcoholic. The problem, that bottle of whiskey is an indication. It's a symptom of his alcoholism. It's not his alcoholism, right? Student back, okay, so you get rid of student loans. Well, what happens to every other student that has to go to school? The system is set up to impoverish students, to impoverish, to prey upon the population so that we have an generation after generation that gets out of college and they got a home loan, but they got no home. All they have to do, all they get to do is pay forever, forever. And since the system works like that, what colleges do now is they raise the prices of everything. You just keep continuing raising the price, raising the price. What difference does it make? The students got a loan. And what is debt? It is claims on future future earnings. So now Wall Street has claims. Every kid that comes out of college, Wall Street has claims on those earnings for literally the rest of their lives. And if the kid can't pay it, the government will make it good for them. So it is a, it is a, a, a symptom of a truly broken system. And yes, you can um, forgive X amount of student loans and a certain amount of people now don't have that, but you've done nothing to address the system. I mean, yes, I want those people to be happy, but you still have a system that is part of the dynamic that is collapsing the American empire. Does, does that make us feel good yet? Does it slow up the collapse of the American empire? Nope. Doesn't do anything. Well, well no, I guess if you've got a student loan to pay, you'll be happy because is, as an individual, you don't have to pay it. And so, yeah, that's, I mean, I wouldn't oppose it. I just want to th philosophically throw in the rest of it. Well, also, you know, for, in terms of the claims on uh, future earnings, you know, I, I wonder, and this is, again, assuming that the, uh, the market isn't already crashing now, but, um, you know, it, if they were to have loans resume, I think that you're going to have millions and millions of people defaulting on those loans, which is going to uh, set a series of bubbles <laughs> To start to start popping after that so it seems as though it like the government there is no way out right like it it seems as though it has to be forgiven one way or the other and it would either be before a massive wave of defaults or after right i mean i, I don't yeah. i just i don't see how they can ever resume it, especially you know it's it's been over two years right and then it the economy is is crashing currently so like at, at what point are they ever going to be able to to have it resume yeah, you make a great point that I, I didn't think about that. And that is people haven't been paying their student loans um, the, due to the lockdowns and all kinds of things that have happened since COVID and the change in our economy, depending upon where you're working, your particular industry might not have come back, et cetera. Um, so are there are some that were even doing well during the... Um during COVID are, are now doing worse. Right, yeah, because that's changed, right? So now what's happened is this, you're gonna have a bunch of people who are barely making it, 
without student loans. You add student loans, they're just going to say, I just can't. Not that I don't want to, I would, but I don't have that extra $1,100 a month that I'm paying for my postgraduate degree from American University. Sorry, I don't have it. Do whatever you gotta do. I can't send you a check for money at the end of the month that I don't have, particularly with bills going through the roof. I mean, we lost, God knows, you know, in reality, they tell us it's eight and a half. I'm hearing a lot of reliable people estimate that inflation is closer to 12 and a half to 13 percent so the yeah, people just they never give you the real number so you make a great point in that um one way or the other these loans are not going to be paid and um we're going to have to deal with that and of course the government guarantees it so we know how that worked the government's just going to write checks here you go well, let's print some money and you get a check you get a check everybody on wall street gets gets their student loans paid off yeah i mean and it, it seems almost as though they're realizing that they they can't just keep printing money, right? Like that's what the, the whole raising the interest rate thing seems to seems to imply is that they they know that inflation itself is, is crashing the economy. So it's just uh, again just uh, the fact that it's gone down so rapidly in the last three weeks and ev like every day of the past week it's been going down. So I mean, like, where do you see this economy headed? Like, is it is do you think that we're all really going to get to just like? massive waves of layoffs and people riding in the streets like is that where we're going here that kind of looks like it i'd say yeah and 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 it's going to be a a, a walk in the park beside what they're going to get in europe <laughs> you know europe is going to be uh what go watch movies like dawn of the dead or you know some zombie <laughs> movie where there's just a few stragglers going around trying not to get, get eaten by hordes of zombies that's what's coming for europe and we ain't going to be three steps behind them um let me say this about about the inflation I believe, only because I talked to a lot of really smart people and they've convinced me, people with PhDs in economics and things of that nature, that the move by the Fed to raise interest rates to ostensibly um, slow inflation is an ideological rather than economic move. Here's what I mean. De de how you fix inflation depends on what causes inflation. If inflation is caused by an overheating of demand, right, then you raise interest rates to slow demand. And that, in fact, slows up the economy, slows up inflation. However, this is not caused by demand. This inflation is caused by several factors. I'll name a couple of them. One of them is price gouging, literal price gouging. One of them is companies lost a lot of money during the COVID and they're trying to make it up. And there's there are uh, a myriad of examples of companies who simply raise their prices when they didn't have to because they can make it and get away with it now. Another thing that's causing uh, increase in prices is the supply chain issue where people want to buy things, but they can't get it. It's not that there's an overheating of demand and people who are buying, buying, buying. It's they want to get things, but it's not available. Interest rates, what does that do? So you've got the people that want to buy things. A lot of times they can't get it. And you've got companies raising rates. The fact of the matter is that the only thing causing that raising interest rates will do is create a recession. It will do nothing to address um, uh, the supply chain issues. It'll do nothing to suppress price gouging. Price gouging, the government would have to step in with regulation. Supply chain issues, they'd have to stop focusing on war and imperialism and say, what are we going to do to fix our ports and fix this and fix our relationship with China and get rid of tariffs and blah, 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 and focus on that, which an imp empire is never going to do. So they're going to tell us, we hear so much they're going to raise interest rates to address the uh, address inflation that we believe it. But if you talk to people who understand it, they say that is not going to do anything, but but create a uh, make it harder for people to buy. But what the hell? If I right now want to buy a car and there's none available because of the chip shortage, inflation rates are not going to do anything. I can't buy the damn car. And the why are cars expensive now? Why are um, used cars, the price gone up 30%? Why? Because of scarcity. We can't, no cars available. You got to buy a used one. It costs more. I just bought a used car. I can tell you that. In, uh, uh, raising interest rates will do nothing to address the issue of scarcity or supply chain. So in fact, it is ideological. In the US, the idea is always hurt the consumer, hurt the consumer, never do anything to it, hurt the big guy. And that's, um, you know, hurt the little guy. And that's what um, this is going to do. It's an ideological move that will make things worse. 
And it's almost the same logic of the sanctions, it seems like, because again, we see that that's not really doing anything except for raising prices in the West. It doesn't seem to be hurting Russia's economy at all. It's just, it seems as though it's, it's hurting the working class uh, for the benefit of NATO propaganda. And uh, just one last thing before I get to patron questions that I did on the uh, subject of NATO, just wanted to mention that it seems as though Finland is now going to be applying for NATO membership. Um, there's been some talk about Finland and Sweden joining, um, and the, the leaders of Finland have effectively announced that they're going to seek uh, NATO membership, and Russia has not announced that, you know, they will retaliate in some way from this. So, um, you know, it's pretty, pretty scary. Again, just considering everything that, you know, we've been talking about for the, the last couple months here with threats of nuclear war and whatnot, and uh, the fact that, that it's getting to this point now where it's, it's uh, you know, we don't know what, what might happen if Finland seeks to join, if that would mean a military conflict or cyber attacks or, or, or what kind of, you know, uh, tit for tat kind of retaliations we might see. Um, and something that, you know, I, I kind of worry about, and um, uh, Colonel Lawrence Wilkerson, when he was on my show, he kind of alluded to this, is that there gets a point in escalation where it kind of goes off the rails and people can't really control it anymore. So I just kind of wonder, you know, are we, are we, are we there? <laughs> like, are we getting to the point where they can't even back down anymore? Because there, uh, there were chances, it seems, though, for peace talks. China offered to, to mediate peace talks at the beginning of this back in uh, February. And, you know, we, we didn't want them to do that. And we threatened to sanction China and all this stuff. And now we're at the point where it's hard to see where there is an off-ramp. And that was another thing, too, is early on, they kept talking about building a, a golden off-ramp for, for Putin to, like, let him uh, save face in this. And somehow that completely, like, that entire idea and concept that was around in the media a lot at the beginning of this has completely faded. Um, and, you know, we have the backdrop of, of all like the, the uh, information war that we've been doing around this is also claiming that, that Russia was going to be using chemical weapons when we knew that they, they weren't and whatnot. Um, but anyway, yeah, I just kind of wonder, you know, is there even a path for peace at this point? Or are we just going like, are we just gone off the rails with uh, retaliation after retaliation? Yeah, um, a couple of things. Uh, number one, I think that Finland joining NATO is a problematic and Russia could very well determine that it's such a threat um, to the Kola Peninsula that they attack Finland. That's possible. That is possible. I wouldn't rule that out. I wouldn't rule the military operation against Finland out. Um, I think Russia's in for a dime, in for a dollar. I think they've made it clear in December when they released, um, when they when they sent a list of demands for their border and their security to the U.S. and NATO, I think they made it clear. We feel right now that you guys are trying to take us out and we don't have anywhere else to back up and we're in for a fight. Um, a couple of things about Finland, and this is kind of funny. I mean, there's nothing really funny here, but it's kind of funny. About two weeks ago, a, um, a guy named a general, retired general by the name of Barron um, was uh, um, testifying before the Defense Committee of Parliament in, um, in, in the UK. And they asked him about, you know, the UK's readiness. And he's like, mm, we're not really ready but militarily. And they said, well, if Russia were to attack us with crude, cruise missiles, could we defend ourselves? And he's like, well, if there was two or three cruise missiles, maybe. But if there's a volley of cruise missiles, we can't defend ourselves. So then they ask him, and you can find this. I read it. I believe it was in the Independent. So then they asked the guy, well, what if we were, we needed to protect a country from a Russian invasion, say Latvia, for instance? And he says, well, if we were to send our military to Latvia, they'd be destroyed by the Russian Air Force within a week. In other words, we're no match for the Russians. Like that shock who didn't know that, right? So here's what's funny about this. We'll laugh at this in the face of doom. Boris Johnson went to Finland and said to them, we will guarantee your security against a Russian invasion in the, you know, if you sign up for NATO. Really? That's like me saying, look, if you threaten Mike Tyson, I will guarantee I'll stand between you and Mike Tyson and make sure that you're <laughs> safe. Yeah, that's, you can run away while he beats me to death, but pretty much one punch will do it. I'm doomed. You ain't getting far either. So I'm not going to be able to protect you from Mike Tyson, right? It was absurd. And that shows the level of absur absurdity going on in Europe right now. Nothing's, you can just say something. Hey, if the Russians attack you, I'll send this guy sitting next to me. He'll hold off the invasion until, you know, the Russians get to come to their senses. And there's like some Benny Hill or something guy sitting next to him. That's what it's come to. Now, the question being, can, will NATO, and here's the question, is there going to get to a point where NATO decides we're going to send in troops, 
we're going to we're going to get involved in the conflict that's the question escalation two things my inclination is to say no and that's part of that is from listening to people who really know what they're saying for this reason they lose quickly right now the russian military is the second most powerful military in the world however the most powerful military in the world the united states is all over africa and africa it's 200 bases in Asia. It's all over South America, bases everywhere. It's spread so thin because it's an empire that even in Europe, the U.S. only has light armored divisions, doesn't really have much, right? The uh, armies of the only country that has a decent army in Western Europe is France. And they're kind of spread throughout Africa and really they're no. So in reality, NATO has nothing when it comes to military. The joke is that you could put the UK military now as far as active um, brigades in a, in a soccer stadium. So the truth of the matter is, if you talk to people who really know what they're talking about, NATO doesn't have a military that could contest Russia. So if they say we're going to go into Ukraine, they get flattened in no time. And that's the problem. If they were to suddenly decide militarily we're going to, we're going to contest the Russians on the Russian border, keep in mind, you've got this unbelievably powerful military that's concentrated on one thing, protecting the border between Russia and Eastern Europe. All of their military might and power is right there. Do you really want to go into that buzzsaw? So NATO is not powerful enough to do that, and it doesn't want to go in there, and it's going to get ripped to shreds by hypersonic missiles in no time flat in the Russian Air Force. And might I add, and a, a, a sophisticated air defense that is specifically set because the Russians know what do the West, what does the West do? They attack you with planes, they bomb you, they attack you with planes, and they don't really like to send the troops in. So they've got this sophisticated, integrated air system that says, we're going to stop them from doing that. They're going to have to fight us on the ground, and we outnumber them, number them 100 to 1 on the ground as far as mechanized divisions and on and on and on. NATO is in no position to do that. So I suspect that NATO, which means what? Which means that NATO comes in with troops, they get dashed to bits by the Russian military. What do they do then? Retaliate with nuclear weapons. And the Russians have more nukes than they do and hypersonic missiles. So it would well, be. Well, I mean, a, a nuclear war would be the end of life. On right, Earth, exactly. Right? So th that's my point. So it's not like you're going to go in and even have a nuclear advantage with them. It, it's, it's the game over. So the question becomes do the neocons want to stick a gun in their mouth and pull the trigger? I suspect not. And I suspect also that there are people in the Pentagon who are pulling back the reins saying, guys, 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 you guys can go as far as you want to. But if you send us in here to suicide, we might have to say no. And you've got a constitutional. So I do have some level of optimism. And of course, I could be wrong that NATO does. And, and what do you see keep coming out of the mouths of the leaders of NATO? Hey, hey, hey. We don't want World War III. They were just saying it the other day, whoa, whoa, we don't want to get involved in a war with Russia. Now they're dangerously stepping their toes up to the edge, but actually to just jump in, eh, I suspect that NATO knows what I've been saying far better than me. And I would, I would suspect that that's not going to happen. I will add this. Time is on the side of... Darn that. Don't you just hate Google listening all the time? Um, time is not on the side of the EU and American leaders because going into the next few months, the lives of Europeans is going to be a living hell. If I know people in Europe and I talk to them and they're like, you know, um, my company's saying we don't know how long we're going to keep going because the expensive for fuel is too high. My Our electricity and fuel costs for our company has gone up 387% and blah, blah, blah. As you start to see their economy crumble, and it ain't going to be long doing it, the people of... Um, of Europe are gonna fly into a rage and they're looking for um, regime change in Moscow. Well, they're gonna get regime change, but it ain't gonna be in Moscow. So it's gonna be a whole lot harder for them to confront um, Moscow when they're confronting um, hungry, angry citizens on the streets of Berlin and London and Paris. Well, uh, Garland, I did have uh, two patron questions, but actually we did just cover one of them uh, asking about Finland. Um, so last question, this is from James. 
He says, when the Republicans take control of Congress, do you think they will simultaneously impeach both Biden and Harris or one before the other? And which one? Um, I think they will start their investigations against, um, you know, they'll drag some things out. Um, they'll start talking about long before they take power, they'll start talking about impeachment because let's face it, now what we know is this, every president, the precedence is set, every president has to get impeached. That's going to happen. If, he, if the opposite party has the power to impeach him, I mean, it's like one of the things you do when you come in, hey, we've got the power now, what are you going to impeach this guy for? I don't know, but we'll come up with something. That's the way it is in Congress now. So, um, but um, Here's the thing about it. They're going to investigate Hunter Biden. They'll probably do some inv superficial investigations of Hunter Biden and superficial investigations of, um, of Hillary Clinton. But the Hunter Biden stuff will, the investigations of Hunter Biden will be in service to the empire. So what they'll say is, we've got to find that Hunter Biden really worked with China because we hate China and China's terrible. And if we can just show that Hunter Biden worked with China, then we can say Hunter Biden's terrible and the Democrats are terrible. And guess what? The Chinese Communist Party is ter terrible. So they're pretty worthless. They'll do some stuff in service to the empire. Um, Hunter Biden was involved in some nasty stuff in Ukraine, apparently may have been. There are allegations that he was involved in somehow transporting money between various entities that ended up in the hands of bio research labs. We don't know, but those accusations have been made, which means that he's in the middle of what's going on with the intelligence community. The Russians will never touch, excuse me, the, um, the um, Republicans will never touch any of that stuff. So they are hampered by their the fact that they're inured to some of the same nefarious parties that the Democrats are, are, are hampered to. So they're going to play the game of something about Hunter Biden in China. Yeah. And in the that's same way that the other team plays something about Trump or whoever in Russia. Yeah. That's what it all comes down to, right? Is they're all in bed with the same corporations and intel agencies and whatnot. So, um, but yeah, Garland, I really do appreciate you being on the show today and, and going over all of these topics. I'd love to have you back again uh, sometime soon. Um, for folks out there, uh, how can they follow you and support you? At Garland Nixon on Twitter, um, Garland Nixon on um, YouTube, and of course, look me up on Rockfin. I got a Rockfin show. I'm really trying to build my base there, and I have a lot of fun. That's the that's the main ways online. Me too. I recently started one uh, because of YouTube censorship that I, I mentioned at the beginning of this, and uh, Rockfin really is the place to be. It's where a lot of different independent content creators are allowed to speak freely. Yep. So I'd recommend everybody uh, joins Rockfin and also becomes a premium member to get access to more content. So uh, Garland, again, I really do appreciate you uh, being on the show today and uh, hopefully I can have you back again sometime soon. Love to. Thanks a lot for inviting me.